the Move to Amend National Leadership Conference. And it is a very important session and one that seems quite, uh, I think, appropriately placed since it is trying to bring together some of the separate parts that we have been uh, discussing, mostly discussing, not so much cussing, but a little of that along the way, uh, as well as uh, grappling with a number of issues about how we move the Move to Amend agenda and the larger democracy movement agenda forward. And that is certainly uh, part and parcel of this gathering today, this plenary that is examining the subject of building solidarity across movements and issues. We heard Tom Hartman, did we not, last evening, among his comments, talk about and reference a website. Remember that? Theyrule.net was the referenced website that uh, he said when you go to, it will uh, give you a octopus-like uh, listing by clicking on any one of 100 largest corporations, uh, I guess, on the planet and show the interlocking directorates and uh, interconnections and intersections between these uh, massive corporate entities and the individuals behind them. And it seems like uh, those entities that we are up against do a splendid job of building solidarity across their respective movements and across many of their respective issues, all of which are bludgeoning us. So isn't it about time that we try to replicate that model in a much more democratic, just, sustainable, inclusive, and nonviolent way? And among uh, those of uh, us today who are with us on this panel are some of the architects who will uh, enlighten us on how to do that. And so I'm very pleased to uh, introduce to you, and I'm going to give a very short biography uh, of each of our speakers on this panel today, and then uh, provide just sort of a real outline of how this uh, uh, session is going to go. So just going down the line to my immediate right, beginning with Gabriella Zui, is the founder of DC Teens Action, a unifying force for social and civic action among students all over the DC area. Gabriella is a recent graduate of Walter Johnson High School, congratulations, and her dream job is a singer, senator, songwriter. <laughs> Next is Jonathan Allen, originally from Texas, an entrepreneur and advocate for racial justice and equality. Jonathan has previously worked at the United States Congress, serving as a legislative policy intern for Congressman Bobby Rush. He also was the research assistant to the Honorable Geraldine Hines of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court. His areas of study include political and liberation theologies, which inspired his master's thesis entitled The Political Spiritualities of Young Activists of Faith in Post-Civil Rights America and Post-Apartheid South Africa. Sounds like something definitely worth the read. Jonathan and his partner, Derek Young Jr., are founders of the Leadership Brainery, a pipeline leadership development and capacity building incubator for diverse student leaders aspiring to join and or contribute to the legal profession community. Next is Jasmine Gomez. We uh, certainly uh, know something about Jasmine from last evening, and uh, I'll just briefly, uh, for the benefit of the other panelists, uh, share with them as well as a reminder to all of you that Jasmine is a lawyer, activist, and 2016-2018 Democracy Fellow for Free Speech for People. A graduate of Boston University Law School, Ms. Gomez has served on the Journal of Science and Technology Law and has written about potential state responses to corporate big data surveillance. She has held a number of leadership roles at the law school, including as co-president of the Latin American Law Student Association, vice president of the American Constitution Society, co-chair for the first year advisory program at BU, and networking chair for Outlaw. During her leadership positions, Jasmine helped create, facilitate, and host at least 30 events at the law school and around the city of Boston. She also received the Emerging Leader Award from the Black Law Students Association. 
Next. Next is Eleanor Goldfield, a creative activist, journalist, and poet. She is the founder and host of the show Act Out, which airs on Free Speech TV, on Dish Network, Direct TV, ROKU, Amazon Fire, and others. Her articles and her show cover people and topics which corporate media either censor or misrepresent. Her spoken word performances blend visual projections and politically charged poetry. Her latest book, Paradigm Lost, blends radical verse with art from 15 dissident artists. She was also the co-founder and singer of Rooftop Revolutionaries, a political rock band born from the fight against capitalism and all the evils that stem from it. Besides speaking and performing, she assists in local action organizing and activist training. She is currently based in DC with a um, website, artkillingapathy.com. That's Eleanor. And finally, Mark Charles, a dynamic and thought-provoking public speaker, writer, and consultant. The son of American woman of Dutch heritage and a Navajo man, he speaks with insight into the complexities of American history regarding race, culture, and faith in order to help forge a path of national healing and conciliation. Mark serves as the DC correspondent and regular columnist for Native News Online and is the author of the popular blog, Reflections from the Hogan. Mark is a founding partner of a national conference for Native students called Would Jesus Eat Fly Bread? Fry Bread. Mark is active on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram under the username, so do note this, Wireless Hogan. Wireless Hogan. Mark Charles. Well, thanks to one and all. Uh, the format for today is we have developed a number of questions that we are going to ask each panelist one at a time. We'll just kind of go down the row, not necessarily start with the same person on each question, just to mix it up a bit. Uh, ask them to try to uh, reflect on the question and try to keep comments within that three to five minute uh, period. I have tried to find the most obnoxious sounding uh, sound on my phone when that five minute period goes up and if that doesn't work there's always this which I really don't want to use. So for the benefit of all of you and for those of uh, you listening in or watching today thank you very much for doing so. This will definitely be worth your while. We shall begin. And the first question in this theme of building solidarity across movements and issues is this. How do the issues you work on and or the groups you work with connect to corporate power, rule, and or the lack of authentic democracy? Got all that? Okay, so why don't we begin right away and hopefully all the microphones do work. Share as needed. Hello, hi. Um, so I, oh goodness, um, I work with uh, DC Teens Action and we essentially bring teens and other young people into spaces where they're not usually present or represented. Um, and in, in doing that, uh, I, I guess the most notable project that we've done recently, um, for, for the March for Our Lives, we housed 300 students from across the country in DC area student homes, so students would meet other students. And um, in doing that specifically, uh, a, a big barrier to many students and, and young people getting involved in politics or in many things is the financial burdens of getting a hotel or having transportation. And so we were just trying to kind of take away um, the barriers that would keep young people from participating in the democratic process, whether that's through voting or through, in our case specifically, attending the march. Um, and so I, I guess it, it um, fights the lack of authentic democracy in that everything we're doing is kind of trying to take away barriers from people who are wanting to participate in democracy and everything we're doing is really just using the resources that we have available to us at our lunch time in high school, uh, just, just doing, sorting through emails on the classroom computers and um, organizing homes that 
are at no cost to other students. Um, and yeah. I'm gonna actually take this off the stand for a second. Hello everybody, I'm Jonathan, how y'all doing? All right, good, good. I, um, I'll, I'll say this first, that my work as it relates to corporate rule and corporate power really began, I, I guess I didn't realize this, but when I was a lot younger, when I, as a young minister in my community, would begin to work with and network with local businesses um, and corporations to create opportunities for young people in our community, um, to give them access um, to certain levels of development that many marginalized young people do not have access to. And as I went on, and now I'm in the law school, I'm in my third year, my last year, and I am very proud about it. <laughs> Uh, in my um, last year, I had the opportunity to work with Free Speech for People with Jasmine, um, and they've already told you a little bit about the organization, but um, those of you who have been introduced to Jasmine know the incredible work that Free Speech for People is doing to overturn Citizens United. And that was my introduction to Citizens United and this idea of corporate personhood. And as an ordained minister, I approached the subject matter, not just from a legal analysis, but also begin to say, but wait, um, where are the opportunities for collaboration here? Where are the opportunities for us to assess our commonality? And the reality is that corporations are not people, but they are made up of a lot of people. And we have to figure out how do we get to those people and build relationships with those people and persuade those people that there are people who are hurting as a result and consequence of some of their actions and inaction. And so that is where my work really, really forges um, this idea that it is in our solidarity that we are strong. It is in our commonality that we can move mountains. It is when we are together that we can really bring about change in this country and certainly in this world. I look forward to talking more with you all as the evening or the afternoon progresses. So, for folks who don't know, I'm gonna give a little bit of background on Free Speech for People. I work with Free Speech for People, and they're formed on the eve of Citizens United decision. And that group actually works towards promoting political equality and anti-corruption efforts through the amendment advocacy, but also through legal advocacy and policy advocacy. So we kind of approach it um, similarly to move to amend in some capacity, uh, but also it's a little different because we have more legal strategy and education focus rather than like a grassroots group focus. Um, and so of course we work with all of the groups that have these grassroots focuses. And I specifically work as an attorney and democracy honors fellow at Free Speech for People. And there I, I wholly and solely focus on the Constitution, the Constitutional Amendment specifically, um, the 28th Amendment. And so I end up supporting all organizations that are looking to forward the 28th Amendment with legal advocacy, with policy advocacy, with strategic development, including in intersectionality, intersectional building, um, and with education. I was a singer for a long time. You'd think I would have turned it on by now. Um, first of all, thank you uh, for having me on this panel. I'm very honored to be here. Um, I, I'm a bit of an activist nomad, so I don't work with one specific organization or on one specific issue. I bounce around, be it from pipeline resistance camps to Medicare for All to the feminist movement, Black Lives Matter, uh, you know, whatever the issue it, of the day is, so to speak that I'm either, either covering for my show or an article or helping to organize around or what have you. So um, in that sense, the common thread that I see, of course, is the oligarchy. It's the, the corporatocracy that we live under is a common thread between all of these issues, all of these people that are fighting, whatever their specific fight is. And one of the powerful things that I've been able to see in connecting with these groups is to connect with them about this issue and then thereby connect them to each other in these ways to say that you know the the the, the environmental fight is the black lives matter fight is the the fight for reproductive rights is the fight for clean air clean water etc these are all connected because they're all being uh, these issues are all born under 
the fact that we do not have a democracy, that we have an oligarchy. And so because of that, all of these issues are connected. And I think one of the powerful things that that we can do as people who recognize that is to connect to these groups and issues and make those connections to the other groups and so that we can build that kind of solidarity so that we're all showing up for each other in whatever ways that we can uh, show up for each other, be that uh, through monetary donations, be that, be that through actually showing up on the streets or what have you. So I think that that's a very powerful notion right there to not only connect these issues to the uh, idea of oligarchy, but connecting that to our issues so that we're never alone in the streets when we're fighting for our issues, so to speak, that we're always together uh, in that solidarity. Uh, before Mark begins, I just wanted to kind of uh, uh, share with you that we wanted to give, even though we have established sort of a time frame of three to five minutes, and thank you very much for all of you not uh, uh, exceeding that period of time, but what Mark has to present, which he will do so in a minute, is a concept that we feel, and he feels, particularly important, and so do we, a little extra time to present to both uh, something called the doctrine of discovery that has sort of both religious and political roots that is the backbone or undergirding of much of the other comments uh, that he's going to share. And so I think it's very important that we allow a little extra time, in fact, an extra 10 minutes, uh, for him to present that so that we all have a common sense of understanding of what that really means. So. Thank you, Greg. So, Yat E, Mark Charles Yenashia, Sin Bake Danan, the Shlint, the Tohiglini Bashachin, Sin Bake Danan Bashache, the Tohichini Bashanella. In the Navajo culture, when you introduce yourself, you always give your four clans. We're a matrilineal people, and our identities come from our mother's mother. So my mother's mother happens to be American of Dutch heritage, and so I say which translated means I'm from the wooden shoe people. <laughs> my father's mother, my second clan, is Toi which is the waters that flow together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Tsinbekedina. And my fourth clan, my father's father, is Todichitni, and that's the Bitterwater clan. It's one of the original clans of our Navajo people. Before I go any further, I want to just stop and acknowledge that we are uh, sitting on the land of the Pamunkey, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Piscataway people. Um, wherever I go, wherever I travel, wherever I speak, I always am intentional to acknowledge the people who are the hosts of the land that I'm standing on. And so uh, I, I want to honor and I want to pay tribute to the, these tribes and thank them for the, the work they've done to steward these lands for hundreds, even thousands of years. So um, if there's anyone from these tribes who are here, uh, I want to say thank you, and it's an honor to be on your land. I want to start by just laying out a little bit of history that most of us don't understand. So in 1452, Pope Nicholas V wrote a papal bull and it said things like invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever. Reduce their persons to perpetual slavery. Convert them to his and to their use and profit. Now this papal bull, along with other papal bulls written between 1452 and 1493, collectively are known as what we call the Doctrine of Discovery. The Doctrine of Discovery is essentially the church in Europe saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, Whatever land you find not ruled by white European Christian rulers, those people are subhuman and the land is yours for the taking. So this is literally the doctrine that let European nations go into Africa, colonize the continent, and enslave the people. They did not believe them to be human. It's the same doctrine that let Columbus, who was lost at sea, land in this new world that's already inhabited by millions and claimed to have discovered it. If you think about it, you cannot discover lands already inhabited, right? If you don't believe me, leave your cell phones and your wallets and your car keys out. I'll come by and discover them. <laughs> Clearly, it's not discovery. It's stealing. It's conquering. It's colonizing. The fact that to this day, we have a monument in front of Union Station. We have honors and tributes and, 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 and ceremonies honoring Columbus as a discoverer of America reveals the implicit racial bias of the nation, which is one of white supremacy, and that natives and people of color are subhuman. So this makes the doctrine of discovery a systemically white supremacist doctrine 
And the challenge with it is it's been embedded into the foundations of our country. So in 1763, King George draws a line down the Appalachian Mountains, and he says to the colonists that they no longer have the right of discovery of the empty Indian lands west of Appalachia. This upset the colonists. They want access to those lands. So a few years later, they write a letter of protest. In their letter, they accuse the king of raising the conditions of new appropriations of land. They go on in the letter to state that he has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages. They signed their letter on July 4th, 1776. Literally 30 lines below the statement, all men are created equal, the Declaration of Independence refers to natives as merciless Indian savages, making it very clear that the only reason our founding fathers used this inclusive term of all men because they had a very narrow definition of who was actually human. This makes the Declaration of Independence a systemically white supremacist declaration that assumes the superiority of the white man over people of color and especially over natives. Now, a few years later, our founding fathers write another document. They begin this one with the words, we the people of the United States. This, of course, is the preamble to the Constitution. But if you keep reading the Constitution, Article 1, Section 2, just a few sec lines later, Article 1, Section 2 is the section of the Constitution that determines who is and who is not a part of this union, who is and who is not covered by this Constitution. Article 1, Section 2, the first thing we have to know is it never mentions women. This is important because if you read the Constitution from preamble through the last amendment, you will note that there are 51 gender-specific male pronouns who's covered by the Constitution, who can vote, who can hold office, even who has rights and privileges under this Constitution. 51 gender-specific male pronouns, not a single female pronoun. So we have to know Article 1, Section 2 never mentions women. Second, it specifically excludes natives. And third, it counts Africans as three-fifths human. So that leaves essentially white landowning men is who could vote. Now, we have to remind ourselves of this. The reason we have a constitution, the purpose the constitution was written was to protect the interests of white landowning men. So today, women earn 70 cents to the dollar. This shouldn't surprise us. The constitution's working. Today, our prisons are filled with people of color. This shouldn't surprise us. The constitution's working. We act surprised, even outraged, that in 2010, Congress sides with Citizens United and rules that corporations now have the same rights to political free speech as individuals. This shouldn't surprise us. The Constitution's doing exactly what it was designed to do. It's protecting the interests of white landowning men. Now, most people think we've corrected this. And they will point to the 13th Amendment, which even the sign over here says abolishes slavery. But if you read the 13th Amendment, it actually says neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime shall exist. So have we abolished slavery? No. Where is it legal? In prison. Well, we have the highest incarceration rates of any nation in the entire world. For every 100,000 citizens, we incarcerate 693. It's 110 of the next highest nation, which is Kirkmenistan and about three to five times higher than most other nations in the world. And we incarcerate our people of color at even higher rates. We incarcerate um, Hispanic Americans at a rate of 831. We incarcerate Native Americans at a rate of 895. And black Americans are incarcerated at a rate of 2,306 per 100,000. White Americans are, are incarcerated at a much more humane rate of 450 per 100,000. So we just have to be clear, Article 1, our, the 13th Amendment never abolished slavery. It redefined and codified it under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system. Now, we also passed the 14th Amendment, which was a direct response to Article 1, Section 2. This, is, this amendment extends the right of citizenship to anyone born on this continent under the jurisdiction of the government. But if you read Section 2 of the 14th Amendment, it still specifically excludes women, specifically excludes natives, and it still makes the full rights of citizenship based to not being convicted of a crime or participating in a rebellion. So while this amendment extends a few rights of citizenship to a few former male slaves, temporarily, 
it still excludes huge sections of the population. And we forget that after this amendment, we still had segregation, we still had Indian boarding schools, we still had Indian massacres, we still had Jim Crow laws, we still had lynching, we still had internment camps. And in 1970, we used this very same amendment in Roe versus Wade, which now concluded babies aren't human enough to be protected by the Constitution, therefore they can be aborted. What this demonstrates is at the heart of the Constitution, there's no value for life. The value of the Constitution is actually one of exploitation and profit, and the assumption is one of dehumanization. What this does is this makes the Constitution of the United States a systemically white supremacist doctrine that assumes the white landowning male has the authority to decide who is and who is not human. Now in 1823, we have a Supreme Court case, Johnson versus McIntosh. It's two white men of European descent. They're in litigation over a single piece of land. One of them got the land from a native tribe. The other one got the same land from the government. They want to know who owns it. The case goes all the way to the Supreme Court. So the court has to decide the principle upon which land titles are based. This is the Marshall Court, the John Marshall Court. So they conclude that the principle for land titles is that discovery gives title to the land. And then they reference the doctrine of discovery as a legal instrument and use this to determine that natives who were here first but are less than human, we only have what's called aboriginal title the right of occupancy to the land, like a fish occupies water or a bird occupies air. And Europeans have the right of discovery, the fee title to the land, and therefore they are the true title holders. This case, along with a few others in the 1820s and 30s, create the legal precedent for land titles. Now this precedent and the doctrine of discovery are referenced by the Supreme Court in 1954, in 1985, and most recently in 2005. What this means is to this day, the United States Supreme Court is a systemically white supremacist court that has legal precedent based on the lie of white supremacy and the dehumanization of people of color. Now these are the challenges that I work to bring to the forefront of our public dialogue. I travel the nation, I teach this history, I talk about our foundations, and I, I try to bring this level of education because, and this is one of the reasons I was so excited to speak here today, because if we don't deal with the foundations, most people believe the United States of America is racist and sexist in spite of our foundations. Actually, we're racist and sexist because of our foundations. And we can paint the walls and change the carpet all we want, but until we deal with the foundations, we're never going to be able to correct these problems. And that's just the first question. <laughs> all right. To what extent, thank you very much, all of you. To what extent, we're going to start with Jonathan this time and kind of go down. And again, three to five uh, minutes. To what extent does your group work, group work and or movement work connect with other groups and movements? I, um, I decided that I, and let's give, um, Mark, a hand clap again. Thank you so much for that contribution. I, I think it's very important and very valuable. So I decided to wear this T-shirt that I have on that is supportive of pride, but it says Black Lives Matter. 
And I thought that it was important because I thought it was indicative of this idea of intersectionality and, and cross mobilization and the reality that there are different movements and different causes that people are seeking after and fighting for, but indeed there is commonality that exists. And so I am the founder, uh, co-founder actually, of the Leadership Brainery, which since 2013, we've been providing leadership development and professional development to student leaders um, who are a part of um, the HBCU community and the community college community. And since coming to law school, I've become more and more um, aware that there are um, different responsibilities that lawyers have. And one of those responsibilities is public citizenship, that lawyers have a responsibility to assess the legal profession and the legal community for whatever inadequacies that, adequacies that exist to the quality of justice rendered within the system. And part of that inadequacy that the legal profession has already deemed as being a problem is diversity and inclusion. Um, bringing people from different backgrounds and perspectives together. We have a very, very huge problem in the legal system with that. In fact, 5%, the ABA says, 5% of the legal market is black and 5% is Hispanic. And actually, the actual numbers are a little lower than 5% but they round to make it sound a little better than what it really is. Y'all know how that is, right? Um, and so the hard numbers are that over 1.3 million attorneys um, that there are in the country um, are active. And of the 1.3 million attorneys that are active in the United States, only about 200,000 of them are non-white. And so we are working to bring together people who are passionate and who are committed and even convinced that that is a problem and that we have to figure out how to get more diverse attorneys into the legal profession. Because the laws that exist and the people who are making the laws are not representative of the people that those laws are impacting. And so in fact, what we are doing are selecting one student from each state across the United States, including DC and Puerto Rico. Obviously we, at some point want to expand to all of the territories as well. But our hopes is that we can bring these student leaders together three times a year for a commitment of three years starting in their sophomore year of college and prepare them adequately, giving them access to emotional intelligence, how to build teams, how to build relationships, how to understand financial literacy because people who come from marginalized backgrounds lack very, very important information which has an effect on their ability to navigate life and systems. And so in preparing these young people for the legal profession, we hope and we are confident that we'll be able to do what Charles Hamilton Houston described as being social engineers, developing social engineers, people who are into the legal profession with a more responsible mindset, but also with being provided certain levels of development that most marginalized people do not receive, so that we can indeed make sure that we're developing people to enter the legal profession so that we can counteract some of the issues that we're here sitting talking about today. And so that is what we do. And we are certainly eager to bring together people who are passionate about that because the reality is if you're passionate about education, if you're passionate about economics, if you're passionate about housing, if you're passionate about jobs, whatever it is that you're passionate about, the reality is corporate rule is impacting it all. And the legal community and the law is impacting it at all. And if we don't get more well-equipped and diverse people into the legal profession, then we're going to be talking about this time and time and time and time again. And so that's what we're, we're taking the hard road. Everyone says, Jonathan, are you sure you want to forego a big law corporate job uh, making $180,000 out of VU Law to start a nonprofit? You know y'all don't make a lot of money in nonprofits. You know it's going to be hard to get people to get behind you and to, know, to donate. But I'm just so eager and convinced and radical that I believe that this is just such a no-brainer that we need more diverse and first-generational people in the legal space that none of we should not have any problem bringing people together to support what we're doing. And so that is what we're doing to bring people together across different perspectives, across different backgrounds, so that we can push things forward in our country in addition to being an individual 
who supports other people who have other movements and objectives in their lives too. There are some people that I just cannot relate to because I am limited in my personal scope. But I believe that each and every one of us must be intentional about learning other people's stories, other people's histories, other people's struggles and experiences, and it's in doing that that we can forge a greater future for our country. So to what extent does free speech for people um, and just like my movement work in general connect with other groups and movements? So when I came into the space, money and politics space, corporate personhood space, I realized, and I talked a little bit about this yesterday, but I think it's worth reiterating. I realized that there were not a lot of people that look like me in these spaces. There's not a lot of queer folks, not a lot of femme people of color, um, and, and I feel like a lot of the conversation around these issues um, seem to miss how the issues of money and politics and corporate personhood and corporate dominance interrelate with other systems of oppression. And I'm talking about heteronormativity, assuming that people are straight, white supremacy, patriarchy, etc. And so when we talk about money and politics, when we talk about corporate personhood without talking about systems of oppression, it ends up missing the forest from the trees. And in reality, people who often experience the most harms from money and politics are people who are also experiencing other harms from systems of oppression. So it's really, really necessary, and I came into this space knowing it's necessary that we connect and organize with other communities and get their invaluable insights and how to best solve the issues that are affecting them and their communities. And so one of my goals, just moving forward in this work, was how do we continue to build these intersectional, this intersectionality into our movement? Um, and when I say intersectionality, I mean the inclusivity of people who have been marginalized by systems of oppression, but also the discussion of those systems of oppression. And so I ended up doing this, moving forward with this, a few different ways. I started with creating reports and doing research around how money and politics and corporate personhood affects communities that I directly had contact with. So I knew a lot of folks who were in the immigrants' rights movement, and I'm Puerto Rican, um, so I don't necessarily have the same concerns, um, but I was always connecting and working with folks in this movement. And so I ended up working with an immigrant woman from Chile, and we created a report on how money and politics affects immigration policy. Uh, she then translated that document into Spanish so that we had it both in English and Spanish, so it was more accessible for a broader group of people. And so the reason that I do this um, is so that we are not just educating our own people in the money and politics world about how our issues with money and politics and, and the unlimited influence of money in our elections is affecting policy that, that other communities care deeply about. And that's so that we can you know, build solidarity a little more stronger and learn ourselves. Um, I also created another report that I talked a bit about yesterday uh, around Puerto Rico, the history of corporate dominance and political inequality in Puerto Rico, as well as how money in politics affects the financial recovery and hurricane recovery. And I did this because I'm Puerto Rican, um, and one of the people that I'm working with from United for a Fair Economy on this report is also Puerto Rican. And so I began, after this, uh, creating events that actually centered people who were most marginalized by systems of oppression. And so, again, I wanted to educate people that were currently in the movement about issues um, specifically on how money and politics and corporate personhood affected the queer and trans community. Um, and so I'm queer, it's really, I am really involved with the queer and trans community over in Boston, which is where I am currently residing. Um, and so initially what I did was I uplifted the voices of leaders in the Boston area that worked within the queer and trans community. And so I had executive directors from all these different organizations that work with people on the ground come and talk about how the issues of money and politics and corporate personhood affected their day-to-day -day lives. And, and as a result, because there's all these trusted leaders in that position, we saw more queer and trans people I've ever seen in any money and politics event. And we, we put out that this you know, event was happening and so many other organizations came and they were like, we wanna do an event like that, we wanna do an event like that. So I ended up doing an event in DC like that and also actually with Move to Amend. Um, so 
so many people were interested in this type of event, and I realized that really this information isn't super accessible to a lot of folks in the money and politics, corporate personhood, uh, you know, getting big money out of politics community. And so I worked with Demos um, to create a framework on how we can make money and politics events that center people uh, from marginalized communities, and that's available at freespeechforpeople.org, and you all can find it there. Um, but enough organizations then eventually asked um, me to talk to their employees, to their volunteers about this framework, about solidarity building. And so I ended up working with a slew of different organizations, um, including with Move to Amend, including with Jonathan, um, about how to build um, intersectionality in the pro-democracy movement. And we did a national webinar on that. And so I've been constantly and consistently as I've been working here, um, not just working on my legal work and keeping my head down, but really thinking and strategizing on how we can build intersectionally and with other community members, because I think it's invaluable and necessary that we do that work. <laughs> Uh, so I have kind of two separate answers to that question because of the job that I do in media and also the job that I do organizing and training. So in terms of media, I think particularly because corporate media does not cover these issues or they misrepresent them wildly, it's very important for alternative media outlets to represent these issues in the way that they are actually happening. The reality and the truths of the folks that are impacted uh, the most by this, which as Jasmine pointed out, are oftentimes people that are already being oppressed and marginalized more so in this uh, inherently white supremacist and sexist system. Um, so in terms of the media, what I seek to do is to find those people, and it's really not that hard, unfortunately, uh, find the people that are dealing with these issues on a daily basis and not only uh, give them the platform and highlight their, uh, their struggles, but then also in that way show people how people are already working on these issues so that people know that they're not alone in these fights, they're not alone feeling that they're, uh, that they're being oppressed and marginalized by the system. Um, and also a part of that, and I realize it's kind of ironic to say I should shut up while I'm talking, but as a white person, part of my job is also to shut up. Um, and to listen to the people who are more marginalized by this system than I am. And yes, I am a woman, so I'm more marginalized than a, a white man, for example, but there are so many people that are more marginalized and oppressed than I am, and part of my job, not only as a member of the media, but as a trainer and an organizer, is to allow those people to, uh, to take over in the sense of letting their stories lead the path. Because one of the things that I've noticed, and I see this with, with poor white folks as well, is that poor folks that are impacted, they're not stupid. They might not have the academic analysis that some of us might have, but they know that the system, can I curse? Okay. Um, <laughs> Daniel is telling me yes, so I will say, they know that the system is fucked. Um, they're well aware that the system is fucked. Their uh, analysis might not be what the analysis is that you read in a Chomsky book, but they know that something's up and they know something's wrong. So reaching out to them and talking to them and understanding where they're coming from and listening to what they need, they know what they need. These communities know what they need. And so often I think that big NGOs and big national organizations completely miss the point on this. They go into these communities and they say, hey, I know what you need. They don't, because that's not their reality. And particularly in a country that's this widespread, the, the reality of a person that lives in Louisiana is not the reality of a person that lives in Sacramento. It's just not. Um, so these communities know what they need, and they know how to tell people what they need. And it's our job also to listen to them. Um, as However you identify yourself as a trainer, an organizer, what have you, that is, uh, that is our job. And um, also in terms, of the, uh, in terms of the trainings, it's also really important to make those connections, as I mentioned in, in the first question, uh, to not just silo yourself, because I think this divide and conquer strategy uh, is one that's been very effectively used by the system that we're trying to fight. And if we also continue that divide and conquer mentality, then we will never move forward, because we will just be falling into the same, uh, the same patterns that the system that we are trying to fight has built for us. 
Um, so we need to move out of our echo chambers, move out of our silos, and as part of the organizing that we do, make sure that we make those connections, like the, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter pride, like, uh, you, you know, all of these issues that are connected under the larger umbrella of the oligarchical system. So I am trying to connect and work with anyone and everyone who's willing to be a part of this. One of the challenges we have in our country is we have treated the issue of white supremacy and the, the implicit racial bias that we face in silos. And so we, we know the stats for one group, we don't know the stats for another group, we don't understand how the oppression of one group of people is tied to intimately the oppression of another group of people. And so I am trying to work to bring about um, the most comprehensive dialogue uh, on race, gender, and class that our nation has ever had. Now, um, let me just give you a little bit of understanding. So there, there's, a, there's an Aboriginal leader, his name is George Erasmus. And he uh, is from Canada, he's part of the Diné people in Canada. And he says, where common memory is lacking, where people do not share in the same past, there can be no real community. So one of the challenges we face in America is that we don't have a common memory. We have a white dominant group of people that have a memory of discovery, expansion, opportunity, and exceptionalism. And we have communities of color that have the lived experience of stolen lands, broken treaties, slavery, Jim Crow laws, boarding schools, Indian removal, mass incarceration, internment camps, broken families, broken immigration system, and there's no common memory. And I, I wanna just uh, show you how vivid this is. So, um, in, our nation has been fighting a war. If you look at our history, we have been in a, in a declared state of war, our armed military conflict, for nearly 80% of the time that we've been since 1776. Um, now, the war, you can name the wars we fought, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, the War of 1812, World War One, World War II, but the war we've been fighting, essentially, since even before our existence, is the war that I call the War of Discovery and Manifest Destiny. That war began in 1492, and I would say it, it started winding up, although not concluding, um, in 1900, but it's still in some sense is going on today. So in 1500, the conservative, a conservative estimate population of the native population in continental United States is six million people. In the 1990 census, our 1900 census, the estimated number of natives in the continental United States was 237,000. That's a 96.05 genocide rate. For comparison, the Jews had a 35% genocide rate during the Holocaust. The Tutsi were killed in Rwanda at a 68% rate of genocide in 1994. And the War of Discovery and Manifest Destiny has a 96.05% genocide rate. And we don't know how to talk about this. We don't know what to do with these types of numbers. And so we need to take, so George Erasmus, he says, where common memory is lacking, where people don't share in the same past, there can be no real community. If you want to build community, he says, you have to start by creating a common memory. This is the work that I'm trying to do. I'm convinced the United States of America needs a national dialogue on race, gender, and class a conversation that's on par with the Truth and, Concil and Reconciliation Commissions that took place in South Africa, Rwanda, and Canada. I'm calling ours Truth and Conciliation because one of the main centers of our, of our reconciliation, if we use that word, is around race. And reconciliation implies a previous harmony. 
If you understand the construct of race, race is a human construct. And America was constructed for the purpose of oppressing and dividing. The black race was constructed in part through what's called the one drop rule, which states if you have a single drop of African blood, you're black. Why do we have this rule? Because blacks were the labor force. They were the slaves. The, the white people wanted as many of them as possible. A one drop rule let a white slave owner rape his female slaves and produce more baby slaves. The American Indian race was constructed through what's called the blood quantum rule. The blood quantum rule says you're full, you're half, you're a quarter, you're an eighth, you're a sixteenth, and you're bred out of existence. Why do we have this rule? Well, because the, the mythology of America is we discovered this land, there was no one here. We have treaty obligations to native peoples. This country wants as many, as few native peoples as possible. So they constructed the American Indian race to be bred out of existence. So in America, race is a human construct and it was constructed for the express purpose of oppressing and dividing. Reconciliation implies a previous harmony. That clearly never existed. Racial reconciliation is a misnomer. It's not accurate. All it does is perpetuate the mythology of America. We don't need racial reconciliation. We need racial conciliation. We don't need a truth and reconciliation commission. We need a truth and conciliation commission. And so this is what I'm working on. My goal is a national dialogue on race, gender, and class. A conversation on par with the truth and reconciliations in South Africa, Rwanda, and Canada. I'm calling it truth and conciliation, and my goal is 2021. So all of the work that we do in DC Teens Action is of and is purposefully between different movements and working with different organizations. Um, and, and that's because as, oh, sorry. Um, that's because as uh, teenagers, especially just entering high school, it's difficult to navigate this newfound sense, I guess, of activism and the ability to speak out more than ever before on a variety of issues. And while many different high school student organizations exist and are doing extremely important work, it can be daunting to commit to one movement or organization before truly feeling educated on the variety of topics that are like in front of you. Um, as myself, a queer, Latina, Jewish, I guess chronically ill and intellectually disabled young woman, especially, um, I have found that it's hard in many cause-oriented school clubs to feel like all or even two or three aspects of my identity are being recognized and or respected. Um, so DC Teens Action was founded and completely run by teens, but none of us are actually in DC. Uh, we're, we're mainly in Montgomery County, Maryland, and some of us are in Northern Virginia. Um, so all four of our main leadership, and I guess six out of eight of our officers identify ourselves as queer or transgender, um, but we're all white or white passing, and though we come from extremely diverse backgrounds, we all benefit from that initial appearance, and also we all attend a school with exceptional resources in Bethesda, Maryland, which is a very wealthy area. Um, and in Bethesda and Montgomery County in general, there's a really prominent activism culture, I guess, among DC suburbs youth. Um, but it's really easy for us to fall into, I guess, the cycle of performative activism. Um, for example, there's some student gun control groups um, that have organized protests at the White House or the Capitol dozens of times in the last few months in response to the same shooting in Florida, which is very important to recognize and has been really great in, in catalyzing or shining light on other gun control movements that have been going on for years. Um, but there have been multiple shootings in the past few months that have occurred in DC, some of which have, one of which I think about a week ago left many kids my age without parents. Um, and they haven't, these gun control groups haven't said a word about the shootings that are happening right in the, the city or, or district where they're doing all of these protests. Um, so all of these groups, DC Teens Action included, are constantly getting news coverage and recognition and being invited to events such as this and such as a few weeks ago, we got to go to a CNN uh, national town hall filming. Um, but we're really not representing DC at all. Uh, there, there's many other things that are happening in DC that these groups 
in, in the suburbs don't know about and don't hear about, and so we aren't really amplifying it. Um, and so, gosh, what was <laughs> the original question? Um, and so what we're really trying to do, we, we, just, we just started in February um, in DC Teens Action, but what, what we're trying to do is uh, we, we've connected recently with some schools that are in DC with some charter schools with uh, a wonderful organization called DC Youth Mayoral Forum. Um, and these are student leaders that haven't been getting the attention they deserve. Um, and we basically are hoping to, uh, I guess first what we have been doing is um, every event has been, or every program that we've had has been something where it's a more adult organization, whether that's a, a gun control movement or whether that's a Sierra Club protest where we're just, uh, not protest, a Sierra Club rally where we're bringing teens and just having um, a younger voice present. But what we're also trying to do is within that younger voice in the DC area, trying to get every type of young voice at the table, especially those that haven't really had a light shown on them for a long time or really ever. All right, we're halfway through our uh, four questions. Next question is, and we'll start with Jasmine. What are the greatest opportunities and obstacles at this time in working in solidarity across movements? Yeah, so some of the obstacles that I see, we'll start with trust and power dynamics. So people who've been marginalized by systems of oppression often have a really deep distrust of systems. We'll start on the system level. Because those systems have often never really worked for, historically worked or supported them. So that can make it hard for people who do have trust in the systems or who believe the system's working or think that the system is rooted in something more pure to understand where others who've never had that experience are coming from. So on a systemic level, People you know, have been marginalized by systems of oppression, sometimes have trust with systems. And also, sometimes there's a, trust, a distrust of the individuals who hold power in those systems. And so that's in large part because at any point, individuals with power can wield that power in a way that would really hurt communities who have been dealing with things like racism, the patriarchy, heteronormativity. So for example, when a white person calls the police on a black family that's barbecuing, that creates a deep distrust because police have disproportionately harmed and murdered black people. And so understanding what powers and privileges you hold in society can help you reduce the harm that you're causing to other people who don't hold those powers and privileges. And to be clear, everybody holds powers and privileges. And so for example, while I have to deal with things like racism, homophobia, sexism, classism, I don't have to deal with things around physical ableism, homo or, uh, religious discrimination, and also even something as simple as I speak fluently the primary language of where I live. You know, so when, for example, I engage with somebody who I know their first language is not English, I don't presume incompetence of that person and I don't try and take control of the task. I find ways through language justice to communicate clearly with people and make sure that I'm centering their perspectives because a lot of times it's likely to be very different um, than mine since we move through the world really differently. And that brings me to another difficulty that I think people experience and that's acknowledging differences and holding space for others in their perspective. Um, particularly, when we're looking back at power dynamics, how can people who have historically held speaking roles learn to listen? How can people who have historically held power and engage in leadership learn to follow? Because groups are so different, we cannot assume or presume that we know how to solve the issues that any community is experiencing. So instead, what we need to do is center people who have been marginalized by systems of oppression and learn from them. Listen and follow those people. And so by following, this is some of the really beautiful opportunities that come, by following the leadership of people who have been historically oppressed, we have this new opportunity to see truths that we might not have ever seen before. We can explore ourselves more deeply and we can make these deep, critical, structural changes to create new truths and build trust and connections.
Uh, so playing off of the, the Nietzsche quote, uh, be careful those who fight monsters lest ye become monsters yourselves. Uh, be careful those who are attacking the system lest ye start attacking each other. Um, the left really loves to argue, and I'm totally down to debate, like I love debating, but attacking is a different beast and it's a completely unnecessary one to engage with. Um, and I think that one of the things that I've noticed a lot in organizing is this uh, purity test. Like, oh, you don't, you know, you're, you're not vegan, so you can't be an environmentalist or something like that. Or this person didn't know the correct uh, terminology to use in this particular moment, so they must be either an idiot or an asshole. Um, the unwillingness to try and work with people as opposed to just cast them out or not even invite them in to begin with. Uh, so building on, rather than purity tests, uh, practical, pragmatic principles. And that doesn't mean letting people get away with racism, sexism, homophobia, or anything else like that. That doesn't mean letting uh, oppressive behavior go unnoticed or unanswered. It should definitely be shut down as soon as it happens. But giving people place to grow and letting people know that, because we all, we all started somewhere, you know? I was a registered Democrat. <laughs> Um, so, we all start somewhere. <laughs> um, and if I had gone to my first protest and somebody had been like, well, then you can't, I mean, that's absurd, you can't be in our group, I probably wouldn't be sitting here today. It's because people were welcoming and allowed me to fuck up, allowed me to grow, and that I also had that ability myself to uh, expect that of myself and recognize that I did need to grow and let myself be taken down a rung by people that could teach me things, particularly, again, as a white person, knowing that I needed to be taken down a rung or two uh, in many instances. Um, and part of this is also this, this quest, and I consider myself to be a radical, and then a lot of radical circles, there's this quest to be perceived as the most radical, uh, a quest to be perceived as always having the right analysis. But the problem is that with this is it leads to stagnation. And these fluid and constantly moving problems that we face cannot be faced with the same stagnant ideologies that we've, you know, for example, if you're a socialist. Well, socialism is an old idea. If you take it to the same problems that we face today with the same analysis that they had 60 years ago, it's not going to work because it's a completely different place and time and different people. Um, and so one of the things that I really found interesting was in Barcelona, Barcelona and Camus, uh, I spoke to a woman who works with them and then she said that when they were organizing, people from all kinds of organizations were welcome to the table but you weren't allowed to represent that organization, you had to come as an individual. And at that table, it didn't matter what ism you prescribed to, but at that table, you were another human being that had the same issues, that had the same needs. And so you could sit down at that table as a human being and work with other human beings, not sit down as an organization. You know, it's kind of like corporations. Corporations don't sit down at tables and talk. It's people in those corporations that sit down and talk. And that's how we should face this in the same way. People to people, not organization to organization and be willing to step outside of the confines of your ideology and recognize that the people that you're talking to have reasons why their ideology is different. You know, these power structures, how, where they're coming from, their cultural background, they have different reasons for being who they are as you do and recognizing the self in them as not just an other, but that you are their other as well and recognizing that and building from that uh, solidarity place. Um, and also recognizing in that that uh, we can't ever see others as they see themselves, but we can listen to them uh, and we can listen to their truths and react and work on our ability to respond, which is kind of like our responsibility, uh, our ability to respond, not always in the right way, again, we're going to fuck up, but in responding in a way that holds ourselves accountable and that also uh, recognizes the needs of our community and the needs of the people that we're working with, our comrades and the people that we are trying to build with and not just fight, but actually build a different future and uh, progress together. So I have to warn you, this answer is gonna be a bit challenging for some, if not all, of the people in the room. Um, 
One of the biggest challenges that I face as a native person working on these issues of our uh, systemically white supremacist foundations is the deep acceptance and belief of the mythology of the United States of America. Um, it's a bipartisan belief, it's a bipartisan acceptance, and it uh, crosses even ethnic and racial lines. And the greatest example I can give you is the example of Abraham Lincoln. So in the past few decades, as race relations have gotten worse after the civil rights movement, um, they've gotten worse in the past few decades. And uh, Abraham Lincoln has come up as the greatest president. You know, it, it always goes back and forth between uh, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. And Abraham Lincoln has been rising to the top more consistently these past few decades as race relations have gotten worse. Um, now, I can do a whole section on how white supremacist Abraham Lincoln is, but we don't have time for that right now. Um, but there's another part of Abraham Lincoln's history that you don't know, which is in 1864, actually 1862, he signed what's called the Pacific Railway Act. The Pacific Railway Act opened up um, land and resources to complete the Transcontinental Railway. And he signed another renewal of the act in 1864. Now, in 1863, there was a short but brief, or 1862, there was a short but brief war with the Dakota people in Minnesota. Um, it was a bloody war, half the people surrendered at the end, and uh, Abraham Lincoln, on December 26, 1862, ordered the largest mass execution in the history of our nation with the hanging of the Dakota 38. In February of 1863, he nullified all the treaties with the tribes within Minnesota. And in March of 63, he gave himself, he signed a bill giving himself the right to, without treaty or negotiation, remove the tribes from the state of Minnesota. That forced removal began in April of 63 and was completed by September. Um, very inhumane the way they moved him off. In the fall of 1863, his general, General Carlton, gave the order to Kit Carson in New Mexico to ethnically cleanse and kill all the Navajo and Apache in the territory of New Mexico. They went through and rounded up our people, and they brought us down to Fort Sumner um, into a reservation that Abraham Lincoln approved in, in uh, January of 1864 called Bush Redondo. It was a uh, blighted, barren piece of land, alkali in the soil, could not support vegetation, nothing to grow or burn or even seek shelter on. And 10,000 Navajo people were brought down there. Um, many hundreds of our people died along the way and those who survived, a quarter of them died while imprisoned at this camp. Um, and then in uh, the fall of 1864, uh, the Cheyenne and Arapaho were on their treaty land um, they had signed a treaty in 1851 giving them most of, north or, of northwest, uh, northeast Colorado and uh, western Kansas as their reservation land. But gold was discovered in the Rocky Mountains in 55. And so uh, tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands of people flocked to Colorado in the gold rush and uh, overran the land. And Lincoln negotiated a new treaty with the Cheyenne and Arapaho, reducing their land holdings uh, 13 times, um, a, a 13, one thirteenth the size of what they used to have. And they were on those lands in 1864 when Colonel Shivington came upon them. And he, they were waving a white flag of surrender and an American flag, and he ordered all of them slaughtered. Um, about 200 men, women, and children were slaughtered in a single day. And within a year and a half, they completely surrendered and they were moved off the reservation into Oklahoma. Now, the Transcontinental Railway had five proposed routes at the beginning. One of them was a central route that went from Omaha, Nebraska to uh, San Francisco. One was a northern route that started in um, Duluth, Minnesota and went over to Tacoma, Seattle. And one was a southern route that went through the territory of New Mexico uh, to Southern California. Within two and a half years of signing the Pacific Railway Act, Abraham Lincoln had ethnically cleansed and removed all the natives from the states of Colorado, Wyoming, and Col uh, uh, Minnesota, Wyoming, and Colorado, and New Mexico, completely clearing the way for the Transcontinental Railway.
he is probably one of the most genocidal ethnic cleansing presidents we've ever had as a nation. And we celebrate him as our greatest president ever. The mythology of America is one of the most challenging things for us to overcome. I often ask audiences, because who writes the history books? The victors, right? Had Nazi Germany won World War II, how would their history books treat Hitler? He'd be a hero. Had Nazi Germany won World War II, how would they teach the Holocaust? What Holocaust? The only difference between us and Nazi Germany is we won the war. Abraham Lincoln's our hero. No one has any idea the extent of the Holocaust against Native peoples. The only difference between us and Nazi Germany is that we won the war of discovery and manifest destiny. And breaking through that mythology to bring about this conversation is one of the most difficult things I have to do. Because Abraham Lincoln isn't just an average president. He's our greatest president. And when you look at his track record, he is our most ethnic cleansing and genocidal president. That's a huge challenge in the work that I'm trying to do. Again, the uh, question is, what are the greatest opportunities and obstacles at this time in working in solidarity across movements? Um, so I'm definitely going to be the typical teenager here and say that our greatest opportunity, at, at least in, in my experience, is the internet and social media especially um, in, in working across movements. Um, so we of course believe that it's extremely important that our access to the internet and to certain websites and, and parts of the internet is not limited. Um, but the reason that, I guess, again using the example of um, the housing uh, program that we did in March, um, the reason we were able to get the word out to 300 students to house them was because our post that we posted on social media gained so much traction. We tried at first to reach out to um, traditional media, like news online and uh, news shows, I guess, uh, to try and get the word out. And of course their thought process is, why would we care about this? Why would we post about this? How are we going to benefit from this? Um, and so just having that online uh, freedom, I guess, was really useful for us. Um, but also in working between movements, um, there's one of, one of the organizations that we've been speaking with recently about um, an upcoming um, project that we want to do is Black Lives Matter DC chapter. And that's not something that in school I would come across a poster of theirs or anything like that. But on Twitter, I've been able to reach out to them and see what they're posting and they see what we're posting um, and be able to talk to them that way and with many of the other organizations that we've worked with as well. Um, and especially as younger people who I'm not able to drive and I don't have the financial resources that many other people do, um, especially in, in the situation of students, uh, social media and, and being able to freely access information from a variety of movements is the most useful thing for us. Um, and then I guess as far as obstacles go, it's really just, in my experience, our age being taken seriously by the leaders of other movements. And of course, when we're not taken seriously or at least looked at by the leaders of some other movements, it kind of makes us think, is this really an organization worth working with if they can't consider all per perspectives um, in their work? Uh, but also financial resources definitely um, for, for DC Teens Action is 
is the most, uh, the, the other most biggest uh, obstacle. I, I think, um, and, 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 and want to say and, and even echo that I really, really do think that social media and the internet is absolutely one of our greatest assets. Um, matter of fact, there are three people who are sitting in the room today who I met on social media. Um, and there are two of them I actually have met for the first time today and they came here with me today uh, to be a part of this conversation. That's how powerful social media is. Um, one of them is actually in, in the future uh, planning to run for governor of Oklahoma and he's sitting in this room having this kind of conversation with us. Those are the kind of people we need leading us, right? Um, Rico, thank you so much. Um, and so I, I think there are several responses that I have, and one of them around both our challenges and our opportunities centers around a concept that I am adamant about, and that is political spirituality. Um, political spirituality, in essence, is a morality mandate that pushes us to, um, to embody a commitment to justice and equality and equity. Um, a, a mandate that causes us to pursue love in every aspect of our lives. Um, a mandate that calls us to call out injustice as it is and to be bold in every space that we enter and with every person we encounter to ensure that we're always bringing to the forefront um, the issues that oppress um, people and cause them to live lives um, that are counterproductive and that are counter humanity um, and that are um, counter pleasure. And the reality is political spirituality as I see it um, would require that each and every one of us wake up each and every day asking how can I contribute and deposit something positive in this world and help make it a better place for real, not just for show and practice. How do we really, really ensure that we're bringing forth our best selves, our intentional selves of getting to know other people and their perspectives so that we can remedy and even correct the injustices that we actually help to perpetuate, um, even if that is actively or passively, because sometimes we can passively perpetuate injustice by being ignorant and not knowing how our actions actions impact other people. Um, in addition to that, though, I think that one of our greatest obstacles is fear and doubt. Um, people who are fearful um, that and doubtful that we really, really can radically change the society in which we live. That's why I love Mark's audacity, because I really do believe that we have to start a national conversation, not a siloed one, but a national conversation and be adamant and be serious about it. I'm literally, be serious about it. Not just so we can say at the end of the day that we decided to have a conversation, but we had a conversation because we were committed to bringing about a real radical change so that our children do not have to continue to have these summits and these conversations. I would much rather to do something else with my Sunday afternoon than to be sitting here talking about about moving and fighting against people who don't care about us. I would rather do that, to be honest. I would rather, rather be doing something with my family right now than for us to have to have this conversation. I'm here because I'm passionate and I'm deeply committed to doing what is necessary to rid our world of injustice, but wouldn't we all rather be doing something different? This shouldn't exist. Our foundation should not have been what it was in the first place. So that means there's something wrong with the human condition that we have to be addressing and letting people know that injustice is idiotic. It is inhumane and it cannot stay. And that's why I say fear and doubt is one of our biggest obstacles because I have people who then tell me, Jonathan, you're thinking too lofty. You're thinking too big and unrealistic. We'll never see that kind of day. So why are you really doing this? And I have people who I come into contact with who do not do justice work because they feel that justice work is a waste of our time. And I understand why they feel that way because when they look around, they don't see any change. They see a lot of talk. People, we used to say this when I was in college, people talking outside of their neck. 
That's the reality, that there are some people who are really committed to justice because it sounds good. It looks good. They get a platform or two that they get a chance to be on. They get an honorarium or two that they get a chance to get. But honorarium or not, how committed are you? How committed are you? And the commitment, the evidence of your commitment is not in the grandness of or the greatness of what you do. It's, it's, it's the things that you do that nobody see. What are you saying at home? What do your text messages look like? What are your phone calls and conversations like? That's important because justice must be wound up in every minute and second and moment of our lives. We must be thinking about how can we help people who do not have the privileges that we have. And even myself as a gay black man, I ask myself with all of the disadvantages that I run into in my life, how can I help those who don't even have the privileges that I have? Because I realize now at a predominantly white law school that there are privileges that I now have, that I have a responsibility to you to help lift other people up. And so therefore we must also, in this last phrase I'll say, we must become comfortable with being uncomfortable. We must become comfortable with being uncomfortable. That is one of our greatest obstacles, people wanting to feel comfortable and feel good about themselves. But it's when we look at ourselves and find the things that we should not feel good about that will cause us to make radical change within ourselves and begin to project that out to the world. Well, the very last question, and with um, your help, if uh, everyone can try to make uh, your comments as on the mark, but as brief as possible, we might have some time uh, to stay within the two-hour period for a couple of questions. We may have to bypass the, what we'd hope to have some discussion and uh, uh, questioning between the panelists, but we may feel that some questions or comments from all of you might be appropriate, time permitting. So, with that in mind, the last question. What are the particular challenges regarding privilege and oppression in seeking to build solidarity across movements? What are the particular challenges regarding privilege and oppression in seeking to build solidarity across movements? Eleanor, care to start. Uh, so this is mostly gonna go out to my fellow white folks. Hello. Um, <laughs> uh, be willing to accept the pain and reality of history. Um, you've done a phenomenal job of pointing out some of that pain today, but there is a lot more. And I think there's this historical amnesia that happens with a lot of us. I mean, it's in our textbooks, obviously, but it's also like in our day-to-day -day culture, this uh, historical amnesia that promotes white supremacy, that promotes sexism, that promotes uh, racism. Um, and bigotry, and that's something that we have to be willing to accept, um, and also recognize that the uh, the the issues that we we um, encounter, for example, like if you if you're white and you have a conversation with a black person, you're like, wow, well, they seemed a little standoffish. Um, these are not ideological prejudices; these are methods of survival that have been built into people over hundreds of years of oppression and genocide and slavery. This is nothing personal. And I think for a lot of women or queer folk, I, uh, as myself and the other panelists can, can attest to, sometimes you just, like, it just makes you un uncomfortable to interact with a white, cis, hetero man. And that's nothing against the individual that I'm in, uh, encountering or speaking with, but it's something that I've learned from the encounters that I've had with many white, hetero, cis men that have taught me that I should be a little standoffish. And so recognizing that these are methods of survival and that you need to, you should get over the, the, the perceived prejudice and recognize it as such so that you can actually try to offer your trust and offer your work in building solidarity with these people. 
uh, I think is really important. And part of that, again, is being humble and being fluid. Again, not like grasping hold of any particular, or, uh, any particular ideology too tightly. Willing to accept that the changing faces of these problems require constantly changing uh, methods and tactics, and being willing to approach these w these uh, issues in a lot of different tactical ways, um, and also in that uh, fluidity, recognizing that the work is never done. We will always recognize that there's more trauma, there's there's more pain. There are more ways that we need to be supporting one another. And this will always crop up. And it, we need to be fluid and accepting of this and also be willing to speak our own uh, trauma by building trust with people. And that's not to say that you should demand trust of others or demand it of yourself, but be willing to build that with people so that you can share that and build from shared trauma or uh, cross-cultural trauma, cross, you know, however that looks in your particular community, but be willing to do that and be willing to build those uh, solidarity bridges. And also, this doesn't mean that it always is depressing. I mean, that this, this particular question veers towards the not so happy uh, answer, but activism is the funnest shit that I've done in my entire life. Um, it is, it's even more fun than touring with a band. Um, I don't have to, babysit four grown men. Um, I don't have to wake up to two people having sex next to me. It's really great. <laughs> Activism is so much fun and it's also necessary. Uh, Huey P. Newton, in his, who was the co-founder of the Black Panther Party, wrote in Revolutionary Suicide that he didn't expect what he was doing to change, the, to completely change the United States, but he refused to live without hope and dignity. And I think that is at the core, and hope is a big part of that. You have, to, you have to maintain hope that what we're doing is possible, and then that sort of mentality will be contagious to the people that you interact and organize with. They will feel that you think that this is possible, that what we're doing isn't just futile, and it's not just some sort of masturbatory uh, organizing that we're doing for the sake of saying that, you know, getting a like on Facebook or something. Um, so I think that that's also really important to remember that this is incredibly deeply powerful and it can be very joyful uh, a lot of the times as well. And these deep connections that you build with people in your, uh, in your communities will be the most deep and powerful connections that you build. Um, and just one final point, I'd like to just take a, a quote that I've heard a lot from, uh, from organizing is that equality starts to feel like oppression when you're used to privilege. And that is something that we should all remember because privilege is a spectrum and we are all on it somewhere. And we should recognize where we are on that spectrum and recognize that equality and fighting for justice does not mean that we're, we're, losing, uh, we're losing our rights. It means that others are gaining their rights and we should be fighting for that um, very hard and with each other in this sort of solidarity paradigm. So one of the biggest challenges um, of trying to bring this dialogue together is really the, the challenge of the mythology of American exceptionalism, which is actually rooted in the lie of white supremacy. So our politicians, if they want to take something in a bipartisan fashion, they talk about American exceptionalism. So this last election was all about greatness, correct? Donald Trump won the campaign by promising to make America great again. Now, how did Hillary respond to his make America great again? What did she say? She said, America's always been great. She said, we're great because we're good. So they both had huge levels of agreement. All the past I've talked about, all the foundations I've, we've laid out, they both believe those things were great. They disagree if we were great today. Donald said no and Hillary said yes. Now at the Democratic National Convention, oh, so, so we think that this election, the last election, was about racism versus equality. It wasn't. The dialogue we had, what we decided as voters was, do we want Donald to make us explicitly racist again, or do we want Hillary to keep our racism and white supremacy implicit?
Now, at the Democratic National Convention, President Obama jumped into the fray, and he said, America's already great. Cory Booker, an African-American senator from New Jersey, he's on the main stage endorsing Hillary Clinton. In his speech, he acknowledges that natives and women are excluded from the Constitution. He acknowledges that uh, the, the Declaration calls natives savages, and he acknowledges the Three-Fifths Compromise. Most national politicians don't acknowledge any of these things. He acknowledges all three of them publicly, but he saves his political future by telling this majority white audience, but these things do not detract from our nation's greatness. I'm like, really? That's like clinging to a life preserver after the Titanic sank and saying, that was a pretty good ship. I would say the systemic racism and sexism in our foundations absolutely affect our greatness. Now, at the, in his last State of the Union, President Obama was talking about our need for a new politics. And he quoted the Constitution. He said, we the people. Our Constitution begins with these three simple words. Words we've come to recognize mean all the people. Now, that sounds beautiful. It's a lie. When have we ever decided we the people means all the people? The founding fathers didn't believe it. Abraham Lincoln didn't believe it. The civil rights movement didn't get us there. Donald Trump doesn't believe it. The problem is, is we've never collectively decided as a nation that we want to be a place where we the people actually means all the people. We have to stop protesting Starbucks and ask ourselves this question. Do we really want to be a place where we the people means all the people? If we do, we have to change our foundations. We have to root the implicit lie of white supremacy out of our foundations. This is the question we need to be talking about. This is the conversation I'm inviting the nation into. Do we want to be a people? Do we want to be a nation? Do we want to be a place where we the people, for the first time, actually means all the people? I cannot make people not be racist. I can't do it. I can force them to decide. I can't make our nation change our foundations, but I can expose the lie of our foundations and expose the things we actually believe and expose the things that we actually celebrate. If we want to be a place where we the people means all the people, we have to get rid of President's Day, at least take it off of Lincoln's birthday. If we want to be a place where we the people means all the people, we, have to, we don't just have to amend our Constitution, we have to edit it. I have a copy of the Constitution on my website. I use the strike-through font. <laughs> 51 gender-specific male pronouns. Strike-through. Gender-neutral proper noun. The clause, keeping slavery legal. Strike-through. We never should have said that. The three-fifths compromise. Strike-through. We never should have said that. Why are we amending it? It took us three tries to get women the right to vote. Amending is like patching something that just has springing up holes. We have, to, we have to address the actual roots of our foundation. So this, this is the conversations we need to have. These are the level of change that we need to, we need to, we need to do. And I love, I think our hope, and I'm going to end with this, is the millennials. They are the most pluralistic generation we've ever had as a nation. It's their parents and grandparents who are at the Supreme Court celebrating because they can now not bake cakes for people they theologically disagree with. Meanwhile, the millennials are just celebrating the fact that their friends can marry the people they actually love. They, they, they've broken down so many of these colonial barriers. And I love the things that the millennials are doing. And I think there is a great breath of fresh air that they are doing to decolonize this nation so that we truly can become a place where we the people finally means all the people. Thank you.
So I'd say that the particular challenge in regarding privilege and oppression uh, in seeking to build solidarity across movements, um, to keep it extremely short, is representation without tokenization. Um, as activists who are coming from places of privilege, the, the real challenge for uh, my group especially is finding ways to step back and properly pass the mic to um, minority and marginalized groups of people and shining a light on those leaders without tokenizing them um, and without kind of them having the mic just because they're the person who's there and, and really just not, it's, it's not my mic to give away and hold, it's, it's, a, it's a mic that should be there for, for anyone to take and just trying to um, make that idea well known to others. And, I, and I, I definitely think that our challenge um, also is um, realizing that the, these are people we're talking about. Real people. And if we simplify it down to people and not just politics, then perhaps we can really incite a true connection to the effects of privilege and oppression. That real people are hurting. Real people are hurting, and do we care about that? Do we care that there are children who go to bed at night without food to eat? Do we care that there are families whose fathers are being stripped from them unjustly because they were, they were caught with a small bag of marijuana? Do we care about that? Do we care about the trauma, the mental trauma that oppressed people experience? We have to reduce it down to humanity and ask ourselves how much do we care about other people and their lives and the experiences they have to go through. Now if we can't mobilize around people I mean, then it explains why we're in the mess we're in in the first place. America has a people problem. It has a heart problem. And we have to start addressing the heart of America. We have to start pushing and encouraging people to think about their heart and asking themselves, what do I care about? What matters to me? And if people don't matter to us, and not just any people, we have to ask ourselves, how can we get anything done without all people? And particularly, young people. The fact that there are not enough young people in this room saddens me. But because we, we can't move to amend without young people. We need young people and old people to come together. Otherwise, we'll continue to have this conversation. It is our interconnectedness that would drive us forward. And that's what we have to hold on to. That's our biggest challenge. We still have a hard time with that. So next time, let's have more young people. Thank you. Pick particular challenges regarding privilege and oppression. So a lot of what I talked about earlier kind of touches on that, trust, power dynamics, things of that nature, um, but also there's more. So first, when we talk about marginalized communities, it's really important, it's been touched on a little bit, to keep in mind that communities are not homogenous. So for instance, the queer and trans community in Boston has a very different range of needs and issues that they care about than the queer and trans community here. So one of the difficulties that we have when we're constantly working with other communities that deal with oppression is understanding how different each community is and then taking the time to learn about what that specific community cares about and what they need and how we can help. 
And I talked earlier about this need to build trust, and now I'm talking about this need to learn the specific community desires and what the community cares about. And so I want to give you all a little tool that I have for activism that I've learned. And it's a rule that's called the trust model. And so for this model, you end up doubling the amount of time that you expect to spend on a project just to build trust with that community. So for example, if you think a project's going to take you six months, you should actually plan for that to be a year-long project and spend the first six months literally just building trust in that community through attending the communities and organizations events, through meeting with community organizers and leaders, listening to the people that are in those organizations and hearing what they care about, and then supporting them in the ways that they ask. And so at the end of that process, you end up building this really authentic, non-transactional relationship that's rooted in shifting power dynamics together. And I think that's really, really invaluable. It's also important to keep in mind that even within each of these communities, there's going to be privileges and supported identities. So for instance, within the queer and trans community, there's white straight, or there's white cis folks, and cis just means that you identify with the gender that you're given to at birth. Those people, um, carry privileges in queer communities that black trans women and gender variant people of color do not. And so we should and always, when we're working towards engaging with other communities that have been marginalized by systems of oppression, look to elevating the people who have been most marginalized, the people who have the most intersecting identities, who have dealt with the most oppression. Because otherwise, you know, we, we probably haven't encountered a lot of those issues before ourselves. And so this gives us an opportunity to really learn deeply. So another difficulty that we have though with centering people who have been most marginalized by systems of oppression is the fact that they're also struggling with so much else already. And so I think it's really important to meet people where they're at and to understand that there are people who are really literally just trying to find affordable housing, employment, transportation, not get killed by the police, not get taken by ICE, get access to affordable health care and mental health services, et cetera. And so understanding this, to bring these folks into the conversation, it's really vitally important that we see where they're at and find out how we can support these communities and individuals to get to a space where they even have the capacity to talk about these issues. And so I think that with all of this, one last difficulty that I, I see for people who hold power in society is their willingness to be held accountable in doing all of these things. And so you're likely to make mistakes, and that's okay. But don't feel defensive about it if someone calls you out. Take the time to listen and keep an open mind. And also remember intent versus impact. Sometimes we don't intend to cause harm, but we do anyways. And we might not even realize that we're causing that harm. So listening helps us understand the impact that our words are having on other people. And through that process of being held accountable, we're gonna find ways to heal, to grow, and to move forward. And we should always find restorative, not punitive ways in making sure that we're holding each other accountable so that we have that opportunity to learn and grow. Well, I don't know how all of you feel about this, but I think this has been a tremendous gathering, both educationally, inspirationally, and uncomfortably, and that's a good thing, because we all do need to be uncomfortable and figure out what we do with that discomfort in transforming that into a positive way. And that is certainly a commitment that Move to Amend has going forward, part of what we all spent some time doing this morning, did we not, was looking at ways and visioning on how to democratize the Constitution. That's a piece of what needs to happen. This has been an important piece of what uh, needs to happen. And this is not where it ends. We have worked with some of you in the past. We have not worked with some of you in the past, but we surely hope respectfully that we can. And we plan on uh, bothering you and figuring out ways to collaborate 
in some very significant and important means to develop programs, to develop processes to go forward, to develop not just programs, ends, but ways of operating that are authentic in a real and fundamental way that is respectful, that has the values, the values of love, compassion, and truth, and the attitudes, the attitudes of equality and justice and liberty. And if we operate with those values and attitudes, hopefully that will result in programs and practices that will transcend the movement that we need to build that has to be much larger than people in this room and even the groups that are here representing. And that's what we hope to do and with your support can do. So that ultimately we transform theyrule.net to we rule dot forever. <laughs> so with that, just want to turn things over back to um, Caitlin uh, for some announcements and just wanted to thank again the panel. Let's give the panel one more big hand. Sorry we didn't have time for questions. You all made my heart very, very full the whole time you were talking. I know there was a lot to reckon with, but it, it made me feel very full and honored to have you here, so thank you. And I could see in people's body language and faces that our appreciation for you is deep, so thank you. I just want to remind everybody um, a couple of things. In term we realized that um, there are probably folks who are having feelings through this whole session, and we, there's an element of kind of getting back to business with the afternoon sessions, but there is a session that's in the afternoon, building effective slash authentic solidarity for your solidarity outreach plans, and there's a number of new folks in the room, so you might not know that to be a move to amend affiliate, one of the things that you are um, committing to is participating in our movement education program, which is a program designed to help uh, your group, your, your new group when you form an affiliate in your community, learn about privilege and oppression, learn tools for exercising privilege strategically and understanding how to grapple with your own privilege, and how to build solidarity, because these things obviously don't come innately in a society that is teaching us white supremacy and racism and oppression everywhere we turn. It's an ongoing process. There's no like, check, I did that, I'm done. But um, Move to Amend as an organization made a commitment that our leadership, which is you all, um, needs to have a commitment to learning these tools. And so the kind of products that are meant to come out of the movement education program are a sol solidarity outreach plan um, for your group to begin to implement in your community and also a democracy um, plan for your group to have internal democracy and an openness to shifting that as you learn more and more about and bring in more and more people from the rest of your community in the work that you're doing. Um, and so, uh, this session is meant to um, be a check-in for those of you who have already done it, but your people who have not are also very welcome to come to this session, um, and that might be a good place if you're feeling excited about everything that our friends shared and are looking for ways to begin to implement anything that you felt moved by. So, um, that is there, and then the other sessions will all be happening as well. So once again, let's just please end with an energetic, extreme thank you to all of you for taking your time here today and all the work that you do. And we're looking forward to continuing the relationship as long as we can until we're done.